Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm very pleased to have Guil Marcus here today. Guil is one of the world's first rock critics and a native of the Bay Area, grew up in Menlo Park, and sort of knew Bob Weir, and sort of knew Jerry Garcia, but uh, not claiming any, uh, any great credit in that one. So he went to Berkeley in American Studies, and 1975 wrote a book, Mystery Train, which is used in college studies now, including by our two videographers here, who studied him in school. Um, he also wrote for Rolling Stone at the very beginning, also Cream and the Village Voice. Some of his other books are Lipstick Traces, Invisible Republic, The History of Rock and Roll and Ten Songs, and his current book, which is on sale here, Three Songs, Three Singers, Three Nations. The number keeps coming down. I'm hoping the next book will be one song that tells you everything you need to know about rock and roll. <laughs> um, so please welcome Guil Marcus. Thanks, Bob, and thank you for coming. So I'm here to talk about uh, this very small book uh, called Three Songs, Three Singers, Three Nations. And it came out of a series of lectures that I was asked to give at Harvard a few years ago. Um, there were supposed to be three lectures, so I thought, OK, I'll pick three songs. And what I wanted to do was to take songs that seemed as if they didn't have authors, as if they were just <coughs> came out of the air. And there are a lot of American folk songs that feel like that, or that are like that. Um, songs where it's impossible to trace their origins, there's no known composer, there's no original, so there's no version you could say, well that's just a copy. If there's no original, there's no copy. These are just songs that are common property. I think of them as commonplace songs. Um, and what, what I was interested in was not just songs um, like a uh, folk song, say, East Virginia, or um, let's see, um, a blues song uh, like uh, Poor Boy, Long Way From Home, songs that are just in the air. I wanted to take songs that felt like that but weren't necessarily anonymous, weren't necessarily authorless. And I ended up with three songs. The first one I, I talked about was Bob Dylan's Ballad of Hollis Brown. Obviously not a folk song, not um, a song um, with an unknown author. Um, a very specific person wrote it at a very specific time, and put it out on a particular album, and there it was. But it always had the feeling of being a song that was handed down from generation to generation, so that even if there were an actual author at some point, that person would have been completely forgotten. It's a song about a farmer. We don't know anything about him except his name um, because it's mentioned in the song. And then the very, very end, in the last verse of the song, South Dakota is mentioned. But otherwise, it's just completely generic. There's a farmer. His farm is failing. Uh, there isn't enough food to feed his family. No one will help him. Uh, he has no friends. And he ends up killing himself and his wife and his children. Um, and it, it, it's the kind of song that always carries with it the aura of the Great Depression. And if you go to YouTube and you look at videos that fans have made, um, they all show dust storms and they all show Okies, you know, fleeing um, the Dust Bowl and, and um, foreclosures of, of buildings. And all the pictures are from the 30s. You're looking at Dorothea Lange, you're looking at Ben Shahn, all these famous iconic images from that time. Because it just has that feeling to it, except it wasn't about the Great Depression. It was set right in its moment, 1964, when it was written and released. Um, but people thought, oh, this must be about the Great Depression. Well, the thing is, with a family farm, the Depression is a year away for almost everybody. 
that's the nature of having a small farm that's totally dependent on itself and on the market and on the weather and forces that can't be controlled. So it has that feeling of being a song that, you know, maybe was from the 19th century, maybe after the Civil War, uh, maybe before it, but most likely the 1890s, when in fact there was a horrendous depression that swept through the Midwest. It has that feeling, or the 30s. Last thing it feels like is the 1960s. But it's a story about a man who kills his family and then himself that appears in this country every year or so. Every year or so, you'll see a small story. Um, about, you know, uh, maybe, maybe it will be two, three, four column inches, but that's all about a man in Florida, most recently, two years ago, uh, who killed himself and his family for whatever reasons. And in this case, it was economic destitution, the same as in the song. So that was something that was interesting, a song that felt as if it had no author, but had a very specific author. And I wanted to play around with how and why Bob Dylan might have created a song, made a song this way. As it happened, he used a melody from a very ancient four or five hundred year old folk song called Pretty Polly, a common song all through uh, Appalachia, all through the South, uh, from the 18th century forward. Um, and he has a very distinct cadence, pounding kind of melody. It's just full of f foreboding and, and you just have a sense of force and something terrible is about to happen. All that's carried in the melody. So he took the melody from that old folk song and wrote new words to it. So that was one example. And another example was a song that really is what's called a folk lyric song where um, a certain person learned this song at a certain time, but he learned it from a friend who had learned it from an uncle, and the uncle was dead, so there's no way of asking who the uncle heard it from. This was around 1900 when a college student named Bascom Lamar Lunsford was waiting for a train to take him back to Asheville, North Carolina, and um, his college friend, um, a guy named Fred Moody, taught him this song, and it was called I Wish I Was a Mole in the Ground. It's one of the strangest songs in all of uh, American music, all of American iconography, re really. Um, and there isn't a single element in it, except one, that can be traced to any place, or any time, or any person. A folk lyric song means verses a song that's made out of verses, or maybe just single lines, maybe even an image, that come from different songs. And they just, they're called floating verses, or floating lines. And a person will take pieces, all these various songs, all these familiar elements, and put them together in his or her own way, and say, well, this is my song. I made this song. I wrote this song. But in fact, there won't be a single original word in it. It's the, it's the arrangement, it's the presentation that's original, if anything is. But here is a song that has lines in it that are utterly strange. It's a song that goes back and forth, verse by verse, between essentially overthrowing the world and sex. Every other verse is about destruction or love. And it starts out, I wish I was a mole in the ground, I wish I was a mole in the ground, I wish I was a mole in the ground. If I was a mole in the ground, I would root that mountain down. And I wish I was a mole in the ground. So here is someone who's saying, I wish I was blind, I was just this ugly, hideous creature scurrying under the earth, the kind of thing that if anybody sees me, uh, that they'd want to kill me, and I'm going to burrow under that mountain, which means, you know, power, which means the state, which means the North after the Civil War, which means anything that you feel oppresses you, and I'm going to burrow under that mountain, and I'm just going to 
paw away at it until I bring the entire mountain down. It's a fantasy of revolution that one little mole can bring the entire structure of power, whatever it might be, um, down. And you go from that verse to a verse about a woman named Tempe, or Kempe, who's running over a hill and she, and she wants a $9 shawl and she's going to let her hair hang down, which is a, a, an age-old American image for making love. Uh, all these things are going to happen. You go back and forth between, I wish I was a lizard in the spring. I wish I was a lizard in the spring. And again, you know, being a mole is not enough. You want to be a lizard. Um, and that verse, again, is, is a, like a fantasy of abasement, a fantasy of, of not being seen, of being there but not there. And then you go back to um, uh, Tempe coming over the hill waving uh, a $40 bill. And the singer says, uh, baby, where you been so long? Now, American folk song is, and I'll be getting to more of this in a couple of minutes, American folk song is made up of all different kinds of codes. Baby, let your hair hang down means let's have sex. Where you been so long means who were you sleeping with last night? That's what it means. That's the only thing it means. She comes over the hill with a $40 bill and I say, baby, where you been so long? You want to translate that, that means she's been on the streets and she's come back with $40. Um, and it all rushes by very fast. That's the only thing in the song that is specific to anything, a $40 bill. And in its way, it's just as odd as, I, as being, wanting to be a mole. What is a $40 bill? I listened to this song, and I've loved this song for more than 40 years. 46 years. I can really date to when I first heard it. Um, and it was only in the past few years I thought, $40 bill? Who's ever heard of a $40 bill? And thanks to this magic tool called the internet, you can actually just go find out. Um, and so I did, and boom, $40 bill. It was issued by the Continental Congress in 1778. It was in circulation for only a couple of years. That's the only time there has been a $40 bill in the history of the United States. Just stunning that you could find this out. And there wasn't one any other time. It was obviously some bizarre anachronism. And you can, you know, you go right to, dare I say it, Google Images, and there will be a $40 bill. And Again, the Continental Congress, it's not as if the country actually had a name. One of the bills says the United States of Northern America. That didn't catch on. But they were trying. They were, that, that's official U.S. currency. Um, and if you, if you go through normal channels, I decided at one point I, w I needed um, a $40 bill so I could use it as an illustration in this book. And um, taking something off Google Images wasn't good enough. I had to get an actual $40 bill. So I tried the Smithsonian. And they, had, they did a search. They couldn't find anything. I tried the Library of Congress. I tried the National Archives. Everything came up zero. Nobody knew. Nobody could find out anything about it. Nobody had it. So I had to go to eBay. And within a couple of days, there was a $40 bill. It was really not very difficult. And it wasn't even that expensive. Given what I had to pay for it, given what I had to pay for it, if you figure a $40 bill and you factor in inflation for 200 and, you know, 50, 70 years or whatever it's been, 275 years, that $40 bill would be worth a lot of money, a whole lot more money than I had to pay for it. Um, so I got a $40 bill and I managed to have it photo, you know, ha have it shot and sent to the publisher and that was that. Um, but that's the only thing that's specific. And it's the only thing that says this song, or at least one element of this song, 
is as old as the memory of a $40 bill. Doesn't mean this song began to come together in the 1770s, but it means that at some point, someone who's putting this song together takes a line from another song, or maybe a poem, or maybe something this person heard in, in, a, in an argument or in a bar. So you tried to pay with a $40 bill. There ain't no such thing as a $40 bill. $40 bill, what an interesting idea. I'll stick this in my song. Um, maybe just as another image of unlikeliness. I wish I was a mole. I wish I was a lizard. I have a $40 bill. Just maybe it fits that way. Maybe it's more specific than that. So maybe that means that somebody remembered when there was a $40 bill. So maybe it could be the 1820s. You can't understand anything about this song in terms of musicology. It's just there. In 1928, this man, Bascom Lamar, Lamar Lunsford, who was a college student when he learned the song in 1900, recorded it. He was a strange character. North Carolina lawyer, judge, newspaper editor, Democratic Party operative. Uh, during the First World War, he was hired by the Justice Department to uh, chase down draft dodgers in New York City. God knows why they had to bring him to New York City, but they did. Um, he actually um, began recording in the 20s. Eleanor Roosevelt was a great folk music fan. She invited him to perform at the White House in 1936 uh, for President Roosevelt and the King and Queen of, of England. Um, and that was one of the high points of his life. And he became a folklorist and he recorded hundreds and hundreds of songs for the Library of Congress along with commercial records. And so he made a record of this song, I Wish I Was a Mole in the Ground. And in the 50s and in the 60s, when there was a folk revival, a huge revival of interest in old folk songs, people began to sing it and began to travel, began to be heard. Uh, all sorts of people tried to record it. And now, you know, it's, it's, it's a commonplace song. It's there. But this is a song that absolutely has no author. It has performers. But um, it, is a, it is a song whose origins are completely lost except for that $40 bill. The other song I wanted to uh, fool around with was a song that I first heard, as most people who know it first heard it, I think, in 1994. Um, there was a film director named Terry Zweigoff, and his first movie was called Crumb, and it was about the um, comics artist R. Crumb, one of the most scabrous, an obscene and hilarious and adventurous comics artist that the United States has produced in the last century. Um, and he's presented, he's, he's, you know, would be about my age now, somewhat older, so they say he's in his mid-70s now. And this movie is made in the early um, 1990s, when he's still living in San Francisco. And you follow him and you, you hear interviews with people who know him or are close to him and he talks a lot and you also get to know his family and his family is a ruin. His parents are long gone, he has two brothers, they're both crazy, um, they're both uh, committable although they're not committed and they're people who live in hovels and, and never leave. I mean they're just ruined people. Crumb, our Crumb, Robert Crumb, we meet him, and he's cranky, and he doesn't like people, and he just complains. I mean, I've, I've corresponded with him occasionally over the years. He's incredibly funny. He's just uproarious, when he, and he corresponds by letters, by handwritten letters, but he's a professional cartoonist. His lettering is just wonderful to read. It's like reading a cartoon. Um, and it's just great to listen to his voice. It just comes through. And it's all about, I hate this. Nothing's, this, this is an insult to humanity. I can't believe you mentioned that to me. Um, and, and you don't feel like he's actually angry. This is just like how he talks. 
But in the movie, you, you get to know him. And he is the ultimate misanthrope. He does not like people. He doesn't like the weather. He doesn't like the way the concrete feels on his shoe leather. I mean, there's just nothing he likes. Um, and he, you know, you, you meet him as an unpleasant person who doesn't want to live in the world, like his brothers who essentially don't live in the world. But he does live in the world. He does function in the world. Um, but he doesn't like it. And then there's a scene where he's in a room, and the room is lined with shelves of 78 RPM records um, from the 20s and 30s. And when he was in his early 20s, he was a record collector. He collected old blues and country records from the South. And he would, he would go through the South like many record collectors did, and he's essentially knock on doors, even in poor white sections or in black sections of small towns, and he'd say, do you have any old records that you'd like to sell? The premise being that there might be people who had old records that they just hadn't gotten around to throwing out. And there might be things that you would really want, something incredibly rare, something that no one had ever heard of that turned out to be beautiful uh, and unique. Um, and you would pay a quarter for these records, and maybe up to a dollar. If you paid over two dollars, you were considered some kind of um, uh, some kind of dilettante, some kind of rich kid who came down instead of collecting stamps, bought somebody else's collection. So that was frowned on, and he did that. He went from door to door, he knocked on doors, and he amassed this collection, this extraordinary collection of 78 records. And so you see him, and he's there uh, in a little room and he goes up to the shelf and he pulls a record off and he puts it on a phonograph and then he lies down on a kind of cot, kind of day bed and he lies down and he closes his eyes and this song begins to play and it's just from another world. It is one of the strangest things I'd ever heard and I'm sure most of the people in the theater had ever heard and you just don't know, what are you listening to? This, this music sounds as if it came out of the ground. It barely sounds like it was sung by a person. It sounds like it was sung by a dead person, a person who's trying to talk to you from the other side of death. All this comes through just instantly, and he's lying there and he's saying, you know, Sometimes I, I listen to music like this, and, and I, I fe feel this is the voice of ordinary people, common people, and he says that kind of disdainfully, common people making a connection with eternity. And then you, he's embarrassed by how open he's left himself. It says, making a connection to eternity, or whatever you want to call it. Like that I should entertain a notion as corny, as, as human, as eternity. And you're listening to the song, you're saying, yeah, right, that's right. This is somebody making a connection to eternity. I could never have put it any better. I left the theater, and I'm sure I wasn't the only one, when that movie was over and I drove straight, straight to the nearest record store hoping there might be a soundtrack album to this movie and that this song might be on it, and it was. So I want to play you this song and then talk about it some and maybe play it again. I'm 
my body, send it to my mother now. If I get killed, if I get killed, please don't dare my soul. I try just leave me out, let the brother see me go. When you see me coming, Look across the rich man's field And if I don't bring you flour I'll bring you both in I looked up at the sun, cried, some train don't come, I'll be some walking down. My mama told me, just be for to die, Lord, said the daughter, don't you be so The Mississippi River, you know it's deep and wide. I can stand right there, be my babe from the other side. What you do to me, baby, it never gets out of me. I mean, I see you after close the deep. So that's the song that I heard. I got the I got the soundtrack album. I played the song over and over again. Gishi Wiley was the name of the performer. And I found out pretty quickly that in 1930 she had made records for the Paramount Recording Company in Grafton, Wisconsin, which recorded a lot of blues singers mostly from Mississippi, for, but from elsewhere, too, uh, in the 20s, in the late 20s and early 30s. And she had recorded by herself and with a partner named Elvie Thomas, E-L-V-I-E, Elvie Thomas. Um, and they'd made records together. Elvie Thomas made one under her, her own name. Gishi Wally made three under her own name. Some were Gishi and Elvie. And what you found out almost immediately if you began to try and dig into this was that nobody knew anything about these people at all. Absolutely nothing. That it was, you can presume because their names and their records and their voices that two people, um, at least who were calling themselves by these names, uh, existed at, at this point in time, in 1930. But that's all there was. There was nothing. Nobody knew the real names of these people because Gishi is not a real name and Elvi is not a real name. Those are nicknames. Nobody knew where they were from. Nobody knew where they were, when they were born. Nobody knew when they died, presuming that they had. Nobody knew anything, absolutely nothing. These were the ultimate phantoms of American art. And there is, this is a song that captivated hundreds and thousands of people and be people, blues researchers, began to search the South and some had been searching for a lot long before this song appeared um, in, in uh, Terry Zwigoff's movie and no one had found out anything at all. It was, it was a mystery beyond mysteries. Who are these people? How did they come to be recorded? How did a song this singular, this strange, this ghostly and spooky and threatening, beautiful and captivating, how did a song like this come to be? Who could create this song? And long before there were any answers, and there are answers now because uh, a writer named John Jeremiah Sullivan spent three, four years 
doing, uh, doing research of extraordinary ambition and reach, which essentially meant finding the greatest living authority on early blues, a man named Mac McCormick, who lived in Houston, uh, recently died, going to visit him, asking if he knew anything about these people, and having him say, well, in fact, he interviewed L.V. Thomas in 1961 in Houston, where he lived. He had heard about this person who he'd never heard of himself and never heard her records, didn't really know anything about her, but he'd heard from another blues singer that there was an old blues singer living in Houston. She'd made some records and maybe she was the sort of person he'd want to talk to. And he had gone to talk to her. Well, that was 1961, that was a long time ago. And he had the interview somewhere, he always transcribed his notes immediately and always wrote up transcript. Uh, he had it somewhere, but he said, you know, I live with what I call the monster. And the monster was his entire house filed according to an arcane system that nobody could ever understand of books, of records, of articles, of his own research, his own transcripts, his own files hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of artifacts in a kind of um, um, Augean stables of, of research. And he said, you know, I, I don't know where, where that might be, but I, I do, you know, I remember talking to her. So here, you know, here, here is the Rosetta Stone, but I'll never be able to find it. So, um, with a couple of hints that uh, Sullivan was able to get from McCormick, um, he began to go through census records and police records and trial records in Houston starting around 1900. Ultimately, over several years and over the discovery of the transcript of this interview, which included the details of this person's real name, Gishi Wiley's real name, when this person, L.V. Thomas, was born, and many other details, including the fact that while she was born in Houston, while she grew up in Houston, lived there her adult life in her 40s, she came to San Francisco in 1939, and she worked for the Key Railroad, which means the streetcar system, and she was here uh, until the late 40s when she went back to Houston. Turned out she was born in 1891. And one of the strangest and most evocative things that she said in the interview she did in 1961, when she was, had become religious, she looked upon blues as, as her sinful days. She didn't want to talk about it. She was a different person then. She hadn't found the Lord then, who she called the Master. But now I serve the Master. I don't do that sort of thing anymore. But, um, she was born in 1891, and she said that she learned how to play blues guitar when she was 11 years old, which is to say in 1902. And she said there were blues even then. In other words, Mac McCormick had found a person, and now John Jeremiah Sullivan, reading the transcripts of this interview, had found a person who remembered when there was no such thing as blues. She could say, yes, uh, I remember when there were blues, which means when I was seven, when I was six, there was no such thing. I'd never heard anything like that before. No one had heard anything like that before. This music, in fact, did appear in the 1890s um, and in a way that it was you know, something in Texas, something in Mississippi, something in South Carolina. When someone would report hearing an eerie, strange, unearthly, unhealthy, evil kind of music where there wasn't singing, there was moaning, and there weren't notes on the guitar so much as smears and slurs 
and what is this and where did it come from? And this is not white folklorists from Harvard University coming down to the South and saying, oh, this is so strange, what is it? This is people like W.E.B. Du Bois. This is people like W.C. Handy, the so-called father of the blues. These are African Americans who are Southerners, who are confronting, being confronted with this music and saying, what is, this, this is, this is not of this earth. This is like what we just listened to. So John Sullivan was able to find out when um, L.B. Thomas was born. He was able to reconstruct her life. And he, this took years, and it involved meeting people uh, uh, who were members of the church that she belonged to, talking to people who knew her, talking to her pastor, um, reconstructing her life. One of the things he found out was that she was a lifelong lesbian, that she lived with a woman most of her life, uh, who was her, you know, her, her wife except under law, that she never wore dresses, she only wore pants. Um, he found out what brand of cigarette she rolled. Um, he was able to find out a lot. And about Gishi Wiley, he was able to find out her real name, Lily May, Lily May Wiley. He was able to find out where she was born in Louisiana, when she was born in 1908, and that they had become musical partners in around 1928, 1929, when Gishi Wiley was only 20, and uh, L.B. Thomas would, been in, would have been in her late 30s, a really unusual partnership, uh, and that they traveled together in 1930 to Wisconsin to make records, and then they disappeared. Um, and what Sullivan was not able to do was to find out what happened to Gishi Wiley after 1931. He found out that in 1931 she had been arrested for killing her ex-husband, for stabbing him in the neck. And he was not able to find out anything that happened after that. Um, you know, that there, was there a trial? Was she convicted? Did she go to prison? Was she acquitted? Was the case thrown out? Nothing. And she disappears after that. In the interview um, that um, L.B. Thomas gave in 1961, she says, yeah, I heard, I heard she was in Oklahoma uh, about, uh, you know, about five, six, seven years ago in Oklahoma. That would have been in the, in the early 50s. But that was all she knew, and she wasn't even sure about that. So she disappeared again. And when I was talking with John Sullivan, because we consulted back and forth all through this, um, this research of his, mainly because 20 years ago I wrote a piece for a magazine called Oxford American about the song that we just listened to. And I tried to talk about the fact that it wasn't just the mystery of nobody knowing anything about these people that, um, that was interesting. What was more interesting was the mystery in the song. The song itself was a mystery. Anyway, it turned out the fact checker they assigned uh, to this article was John Jeremiah Sullivan. So years later, when the bug of this song bit him, he got in touch and we began to bat ideas back and forth. Um, and he was not able to find out anything about her after that. And he just mentioned, you know, I don't even know when and where she died. And then he said, if she died, he said she'd be 106 today. It's, it's possible. It's possible that she's alive. It's possible that in 1994, somebody said to her, when she was an old woman, said to her, you know, I saw this movie and they played your song in it. That maybe she went to see the movie. Maybe she's, you know, you begin to fantasize about this. Right about this time, I was telling my wife about the call I just had with John Sullivan. And she said, that's interesting. You know, um, our doctor, who she had just been to see, mentioned that his oldest patient was a black woman 
who was 106, and you know, light bulbs are going off like crazy. <laughs> oh my God! I mean, here and he's a Berkeley doctor, but her, you know, L.V. Thomas was in San Francisco for 10 years in the in the 1940s. Why shouldn't she end up in Berkeley? So I called him, and I said, you know. Um, um, your patient, you have a patient who's 106. He said, yeah, Bertha Johnson. I, oh, okay, Bertha Johnson. He said, why do you ask? And I told him, and he said, oh, that's not her. He said, but she did sing with Louis Armstrong. And he thought, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the jokes history plays on us. Um, and yet, what is so fascinating about this song, particularly looking for authorless songs, songs that, that just seem to be part of the landscape, that just seem to emerge from it, is that here is a song with a melody that nobody recognizes, played in a minor key, which was completely uncharacteristic of blues, um, and with lines in it that come from countless other songs that are just generic. They're the essence of, of what it means to be a commonplace song, uh, a, a, just that you quote from some other song. Lines like, and maybe you caught it, my mother told me. Now in blues, there's only one time when your mother tells you anything. She doesn't tell you when you're about to get married. She doesn't tell you when you're about to leave home and seek your fortune. Your mother only tells you something just before she died. And that's the way this line goes. My mother told me just before she died. There's another verse when she mentions the Mississippi River. And again, in blues and in old country music, when you mention the Mississippi River, there's something you have to say about the Mississippi River. You have to say, it's deep and wide. And after you've said, the Mississippi River, you know it's deep and wide, then you can go say something of your own if you have the imagination to do that. But it's, so it has these elements. Um, I went to the depot. I looked up at the sun. That's from hundreds of songs. And what comes after that? And um, one song goes, I went to the depot. I looked up at the sun. Sometimes it's the sign telling you when the trains are going to arrive. In one song it says, I went to the depot, I looked up at the sign, it said, good times here, but better down the road. OK, that's interesting. When Gishi Wiley sings the line, I went to the depot, I looked up at the sun, said, train don't come, going to be some walking done. Just something she wanted to put in there. That's what she put in. But there are also lines in this song that have never appeared, as far as anybody has been able to find, in any other song, or for that matter, in a poem, or a novel, anywhere. Lines that seem as if they had to come from one person at one time only, from this woman named Gishi Wiley, and that was it, because no one else had ever come up with these images. And then there were variations on commonplace verses that again were twisted and, and, and distorted so that they would create an aura, they would create a mood, they'd create an atmosphere that was different, that was complete, that was total, and an atmosphere of death. It starts out, the last kind words I hear my daddy say. Lord, the last kind words I hear my daddy say. That's the whole first verse. And it sets you up. All right, what are they? What did he say? And he says something that, again, never, no one had ever heard before. He says, if I die, if I die, in the German war, I want you to send my body, send it to my mother-in-law. 
It's hard to understand. The words aren't altogether clear, but when I first heard that, I thought, this is the ultimate mother-in-law joke. <laughs> or else he really loved his mother-in-law. I mean, what an... And, and also, it's very spooky for us listening today. If I die, if I die in the German war, this is recorded in 1930, she doesn't know there's going to be another German war. So it unsettles time for us. It just makes it, turns it into a wheel, makes it spin. And then the next verse is so brilliantly constructed. And I'll play the song again. Listen to the way she takes a single syllable. Most often it's the word I, but it doesn't have to be. It can, but she takes a single syllable or a phoneme and she stretches it out all the way across what for any other singer would be an entire line. And she just holds that note in the air until you're so captivated by the sound that she's making, you may, even, you may forget to even hear what words she's singing, because it doesn't matter. Because the atmosphere of death that she is creating around this song in every single verse, in every note, is so complete that you don't need words to explain to you what the song is about. The next, word, next verse is, if I get killed, if I get killed. And she has constructed this so perfectly. If she were to say, if I get killed, if I get killed, it would take the weight, it would take the impact away from the word killed, because the word if has its own body, has its own strength. But she dispenses with the I. He says, if I get killed, if I get killed, you've got a very soft opening and then a hard consonant, the K, if I get killed, killed. So kill comes across. If I get killed, if I get killed. And then again, she goes off into an area where no one's ever been before. If I get killed, if I get killed, please don't bury my soul. Just leave me out. Let the, vulture, let the buzzards eat me whole. All right, okay. That goes back thousands and thousands of years to when early settlements, Neolithic settlements um, in Turkey and in other places, their form of burial was to take the dead, leave them outside the walls of the settlement, let the buzzards pick the bones clean, and only then dispose of the bones in a ritualistic manner that we would recognize. But that's what people did. And that goes back, whether that is a kind of human race memory, what Jung would call a collective memory, whether it's a story that she was told in her childhood that passed down over the centuries, who knows? But in any case, it's there. And it's never appeared in any song that anybody knows. But she can pull the string. When she gets to the verse, the Mississippi River, you know it's deep and wide. The conventional way to finish that verse is to say, I can, <clears throat> I can stand right here and see my baby on the other side. See, Mississippi River, it's deep and wide, but I love my baby so much that I can stand here and I can see her on the other side because just, you know, my heart is filled with love and it's given me extraordinary eyesight. And I can see all the way across the Mississippi River. And that's not what she says. She, and, and this is a woman of a mind that isn't ours, that is hers, who thinks differently than we do, who sees things differently than we do. She says, I can stand right here see my face from the other side. That is stranger. She is standing here. She sees her face on the other side of the river, but she is seeing her face from the other side of the river, which means she's in two places at once, and seeing her own face all the way across the Mississippi River. And that destabilizes the song. That like opens up a trap door in the song. And she follows it with the next verse. What you do to me, baby, it never gets out of me. And that couplet may have appeared in other blues songs. I've never heard it. It's just a moment of extraordinary 
warmth, tenderness. It's incredibly erotic. It's just this, this, this blessing right there in the first two lines of the song. And she says, I may not see you when I cross the deep blue sea. The deep blue sea, again, talking about coatings and blues. The deep blue sea means death. When you cross the deep blue sea, you are going to the other side. You are going to die. Um, and you're supposed to say, I know I'll see you when I cross the deep blue sea. And it's so mandated in the nature of blues, that any number of people who've transcribed this song and put the lyrics up on the internet say, I know I'll see you when I cross the deep blue sea. That's what she ought to say. It just isn't what she says. She, everybody in this song has to be dead. The last kind words I hear my daddy say. In blues, daddy usually means lover or husband. It doesn't mean father. But it could mean father here. My mother just before she died. I can see my face on the other side. I'm already dead. I may not see you when I cross the deep blue sea. Everybody in this song is dead, including the singer. And if you listen, if you allow yourself to be taken in by her guitar solos at the beginning of the song and in the middle, you will hear that same sense of foreboding that same sense of completeness that you could get in a short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne, like The Minister's Black Veil um, or um, uh, Goodman Brown. Um, that's what you hear. You hear the American Gothic, the sense of curse, the sense of deviltry. So I want to play the song one more time and talk a little more about it. What you do to me, baby, 
It never gets out of me. I mean, I have to close the key. It's a privilege being able to talk with you today. Thank you for coming.